In this season of Lent, we share a theme for our worship, and I want to read to you briefly this passage before I read our passage, main passage for the day. Psalm 107 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. And then from the Gospel of Luke, we read in the 13th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. And he replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. What's your story? What's your story? In the course of this time between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday, we're on a journey to try to remember and claim again what is the story that you and I are a part of. Now, within it, there's that personal part of it, which is truly your story, and I have my personal story, which is my story, and to be honest with you, a lot of us don't deal with that enough. We kind of glide through and let things happen, but all along the way, God is writing something special within each of us and our experiences with Him. And truth is, we need to be focusing sometimes on what is my story. And then when I walk through this journey of looking at the life and experience of Jesus Christ, what I discover is that there's a connection between my story and his story. So that surely by Easter Sunday, we recognize the fact that together, we have a story to tell. Well, uh, in our worship planning, we decided that the What's Your Story would be our theme for this time of Lent, and, and then we came up with this idea of maybe we need a book of some kind, a blank book before us that we could write into with our hearts and our spirits, and behold, the book appeared. And with it came that opportunity to write and and lift up some words that make up our story. We began on Ash Wednesday with the words, in the beginning. It was a way to kind of walk us into an understanding that we all have the same beginning. It's in God. From dust we come to dust we shall return. It's that remembrance that when you take away all the decorations, all the accomplishments, all the achievements that you and I have, all the accolades and labels that we hold, you have child of God. So all of us have the same words that start our story in the beginning. And then last week, we talked about finding focus, looking at that experience where Jesus was in the wilderness. We began to realize how important it is for us in our story to have that focus of where it's going. It has to have some message that leads us forward. It can't just be random thoughts. It needs to be something that leads us somewhere. And being focused on where we're going and whose we are becomes a key part of our story. Today, we're going to talk about our story being a part of how it has a message of full circle. In this passage that we're looking at today, we see Jesus in a crossroads of his ministry where he's been teaching and offering words uh, of wisdom and understanding. In some cases, he's speaking truth and love. And he's approached by some who want to help him out by letting him know that he's in danger. If you didn't notice, it was the Pharisees who came to him and offered this word of safety and encouragement. We're not used to thinking of the Pharisees that way, are we? We've already labeled that group pretty much. They're the ones that, oh man, nothing but trouble, right? And what we discover here in this passage is that there are few that get it. Maybe their story 
somewhere is that they have that aha moment that they begin to recognize that this is not just any man. And they risk to come to him and say to him, you need to find a place that's safe. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus being Jesus responds in a Jesus way. You can tell that fox. And fox is a key word here because the fox has many labels to it. It's sly. It's deceptive. You can tell that fox that I'm on a mission. And the mission is, is that I will continue to remove demons. I will continue to offer healing. I will continue to do this today and tomorrow and the third day. And now we hear that word third day. And then he says, that's what I'm here for. I'm going to continue until that third day because that's where I need to be. Nothing's going to stop me. And then we see this lament over Jerusalem that takes place. Jerusalem is considered the holy city, the very place, the love of God. Those who are deemed to be the true essence of what God has and feels for his people. And with this image of Jerusalem then, we have, we have this moment in which Jesus laments. It's that whole image again of him uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane in tears. It's that image of him weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. It's the human side of Jesus that, that hurts. And he looks over Jerusalem and he offers these words that are just words of compassion. Because what he witnesses is the fact that Jerusalem, although they think they've got it all together, although they feel like they're the holy city, they're removing themselves from the depth of God's love. I know it's hard to perceive that in our minds that people could be so confident in themselves that they would think that it's always about someone else. I grew up in a small church, and I can remember on many a Sunday when the pastor would get to the point in his message where he'd be offering the word of invitation. It was a small church. Everybody knew everybody, and if you were a guest, you stood out like a sore thumb, okay? And they all knew you were guests because you sat in someone else's pew first. Then you probably sat in the place where you weren't supposed to sit uh, anyway because that was reserved for the guests. That's why we don't sit there so that you will and will know who you are. Yeah, it's very strategic. But when the pastor would get to a point in his sermon where he really was giving that invitation, that word of opportunity for people, it was not unusual to see a few heads turn around and go. It almost had that gesture of, I hope y'all are listening. And I know some of y'all need this. In our heart and our spirit sometimes, we always think it's about someone else especially when it comes down to embracing the need for God in our life. The people of Israel are in a place and a time in which they feel like they truly are the restored, holy people of God. They have faced exile. They have come. They have rebuilt the city itself. God has made them his people, and he is their God. And we got it together. If you could put first church righteous, they would do it because they're convinced that all we have to do now is wait on God. And yet right in their midst was this Messiah who looks over Jerusalem and has a lament, a moment in which he's, his heart is hurting for them because they don't know what they have said no to. <laughs> Uh, I, I have some opportunity to work with our Emmaus community and Emmaus uh, ministries, and it's an upper room ministries where we do um, the, uh, disciple weekends, if you could put it, a spiritual retreat that nurtures us into remembering our faith and to, to claim again what are the principles of our faith, and it brings us back restored for a commitment to the holy church that we're part of. 
In the course of that, there's prayers that are used in the worship experiences that are carefully worded and scripted. And among them are these prayers that offer words like this. Lord, help the very ones in this room that have problems right now. And then there's a pause. And it's in, and, and we pray for those who have the greater problem of thinking they have no problems at all. I think there's a truth to that about us, that there are times in which we're caught up in the experience of thinking that maybe we don't have the problem when we have a Christ that laments over us and says to us time and again, you have no idea what you're saying no to. Think about it this way. God's love through Jesus Christ reaches a point here where it looks over Jerusalem and that love drives him to a, a moment in which he laments over the ways in which they have already rejected the prophets and already positioned themselves to be the very ones that he would eventually come back to on that third day and put him to death. But love drove him and that knowledge still to love them. Um, it's a powerful thing to think about God's love as being relentless. That no matter how many times and how many ways you or I, intentionally or unintentionally, may say no to his love, he will never stop loving you. John Wesley speaks about this in a frame of, of grace. He talks about the fact that we have a provenient grace from God in which when we begin life, God loves us first. And we may not even be aware of him or understanding of him, but as we grow and mature, God loves us relentlessly. And there comes a point in time in which our understanding reaches a place that we look backwards and we go, on, oh, that was you. That was you. Look, you loved me through everything, and, and I got to where I am today because of you and that relentless love. And when we start to really identify God's love in that way, we move ourselves to a place that we have our justifying grace, that moment that we say yes instead of no, because we want to respond to that kind of love. And it becomes a life and relationship that moves us forward through God's sanctifying grace where he handles every single no that we ever utter again with a relentless love. Sure, you meant someone else, God, not me. I'm, I'm child of God, remember? Okay, yeah, I still got problems. And I can do better. You're right. Yes again. Yes again. Yes again. Oh, I know, we had this image of what the life and relationship with God is supposed to look like. We had this image of where we're really walking in our discipleship, and hopefully our story will be one that we can write here that says, yes, here's me and the love of God. It's this, this wonderful plane of life and experience where I've just grown closer and closer to Him. It's been happy, happy, happy. But there's a real story that you and I have to identify today. Let's see that other image I have here, if we could. There you go. James reminds us that we will probably have a life that's more like the second plan. <laughs> because as much as we want to tell God we have that first plan, I'm, oh, I'm never going to let you go, God. I'm loving you back. It's, not gonna be, it's me up and right. God knows who we really are. He knows our hearts. He laments over the moments that we will hit those valleys. He laments over the things that will bring us down and pull us away. But he will never let go. And I think we need to claim that today because God laments over the nose in our heart. You can go ahead now back to the screen that we had. If you haven't had a chance yet, I want you to look in your Bible over to Luke chapter 19. It's if, you, if it's be like looking at our story today, here we are, we're witnessing this full circle of God's love that won't let go, that keeps coming back to us again and again and asking us for this relationship that even when we think we got it together, God keeps standing right there going, but there's more, there's more, there's more. And he laments for the times that we reject it or don't access it the way we can. But Luke chapter 19, we kind of look ahead in our story for just a little bit. And then we'll come back to reality. 
Luke chapter 19, beginning with the 40, um, let's see, the 41st verse. We have the story of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Now let me back up to the 39th verse. As he's entering the city, the holy city that he's lamented over in our passage today, he begins to come back into them on this third day experience. And he comes to them and, he, and it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he says, I tell you, he replied, they, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, See if you know these words. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. <laughs> but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. It's a repeat of the very message of how God's love really comes full circle. He laments over them, but he knows that he has those three days experience still to do. He has the ministry and the witness, the work of God, the healing, the teaching, all the miracles that take place. But he knows it will all eventually lead to the Jerusalem encounter itself where God's people will still again reject his love. You know, we talked with the children a while ago, and I think about that for God, how painful it is to love someone so much and have them say no. Because God loved you so much that he gave his only son so that you could have life and life everlasting, a joy abundant and fulfilled. And yet God's people, even today, will sometimes say no. I struggle with it. And I, I think if you're human, you struggle with it. Even in our best efforts of trying to be a yes and accepting uh, disciple of God's love, my real story is that I have a God's love that goes full circle for me, and I'm always in need of it. The story about the pastor who laid in bed one morning and began his morning prayer, and he said, God, I want you to know I've been a faithful disciple. I followed your word. I study it. I preach your word. I witness you everywhere I go. Nothing but your love, Jesus. Nothing but your love. But in a moment, I have to get out of bed. And I'm going to need your help. It's really our story. Your story is one of God's love coming full circle in your life, some form or some way. Maybe you need to get in touch with that again. The ways that you have witnessed, the times that you have separated yourself in some way. I don't care. It could be any experience of your life that you want to look back on. But you have also then probably witnessed a God's love that has gone full circle for you and brought you back. He has loved you anyway. Let's write our story. Let's claim again this divine love of God that laments over the times we say no. And yet loves us back to a yes. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to have a word of prayer with you, and then I want us to sing our closing song. It's a little different from my traditional prayer and process with you, but I think it's important for this message to do that. Will you pray with me? God, you alone know every heart in this room right now. And you know that our faces may sometimes give an impression that we got it all together and that we're, we're fully focused on you and that there's a yes in our lives that are taking place. But you also know our heart where sometimes we still struggle with the fact that we don't think we're worthy. And maybe we've pushed you back a little bit. Maybe we've resisted and put a limit on your love for us. Maybe we've questioned your love for us. 
Maybe we've put you in a box in our hearts and spirits in such a way that your love cannot fully do its work. Maybe there's something deep within us that has driven us to reject you altogether. We feel your lament. We feel the sadness that it comes to be anything less than fully accepting of your grace. So God, do your work. Show us again your love full circle so that in this moment, this time, right here, right now, any heart in this room can accept the divine love, forgiveness, and grace that you offer. For our story will continue to tell and speak of a relentless love that goes full circle. I pray for any person in this room right now, God, that has said yes, that has found the courage and the ability to let go of a no. Not now, maybe later, another time, not yet. Amen.